Somewhere off the southwest coast of Africa, a cold ocean meets the land. Here, relentless winds continuously reinvent the landscape. Seen from outer space, the sandstorms blow hundreds of kilometers out over the ocean, leaving behind a quiet and apparently deserted landscape of solitude and order. The tallest dunes in the world are found here, giving way to mirages that trick the senses, blurring reality and make-believe. This is the coastline of Namibia, stretching from the Kunani River in the north, some 1,500 kilometers, to the Orange River in the south. It has many stories to tell. Seemingly empty, the Namibian coastline is flanked by a cold ocean. Its secret? The wealth of living marine resources that depend on the nutrient-rich waters. In the swaying inshore waters, rays of the sun feed the kelp, which forms part of the bottom end of the food chain, while also providing shelter for many species. The Cape fur seal is well adapted to life in the cold waters. Here at Cape Cross, more of them are found than in any one place anywhere else in the world. Hundreds of thousands of them live along this desert coast. Returning from the sea, this mother calls to her pup. It eagerly responds. Mothers recognize their pups by sight, sound, and finally smell. A lone black-back jackal patrols the shore. It soon encounters the carcass of a seal, a lucky find in a land where scarcity reigns. The jackal searches for anything it can eat. Its lonely home, the ghostly ruins of a time long gone by. Something big must have happened here. One century ago, the first diamond found its way into the hands of colonial-era businessmen. Soon, a diamond industry of impressive proportions was in full swing. The master must have had a grand time. While the workers slept in concrete cubicles, their respective realities worlds apart. Diamond mining still continues and has always been one of the cornerstones of the Namibian economy. Extracting the stones from ancient marine beds where the diamonds were deposited after being washed down the Orange River. In some places, the machines have become silent, while elsewhere, large amounts of overburden continue to be removed to get to the bedrock where the valuable diamonds are found. Many tons of material have to be removed to recover a single carat of diamonds. Large areas have been mined out, leaving massive tracts of bedrock exposed and vacuum dry to suck up the heavier diamonds which lie in the cracks. For large sections of coast, even the position of the shoreline has changed. Today, the new frontier lies in the sea Specially equipped vessels, well-trained staff, and state-of-the-art technology are used to recover diamonds from the ocean's depths. The higher level of technology requires far less labor than mining on land, where reserves are becoming depleted, leading to increased job losses. Only the future generations will know the real cost of diamonds. Slowly, 
Nature is recovering from this onslaught and reclaiming what once belonged to it. The tooth of time biting away at abandoned human structures. But how long will it take? Further north, where there is no mining, an endless cycle of wind reshapes the land. The Skeleton Coast has taken its toll, starting from when the first outsiders set foot here and continuing to the present day. Yet the Namibian coastal desert has a softer, gentler side. With a change of weather, fog rolls in from the sea and blacks out the early morning sun, bringing an eerie atmosphere to the coastal lagoons. It is as if a large unseen hand is drawing a blanket over the land, as the cold air blowing in off the Atlantic Ocean meets the warm land and turns to water vapor. The wet fog makes the air clammy, soon drops sparkle in what was a parched landscape a few hours before. Standing head down on the dune face, a fog-basking beetle directs condensed fog to its mouth, while a sidewinder drinks droplets off its body. As the morning progresses, temperatures are starting to rise and the sidewinder sets off to find shelter for the day. When the fog lifts, the landscape is drenched by the rays of the sun. The Ruptropus gecko finds a high spot in the afternoon breeze and opens its mouth for further cooling through evaporation. As the wind and sun becomes hotter, the shovel-nosed lizard raises its body off the hot sand and alternates its feet. Always keeping a watchful eye for predators, that may strike from above. The evening brings a distant promise of rain. A few drops fall on the dunes, and then more. This unusual occurrence is most welcome. While the desert's ecology is influenced by the sea, other impacts start far inland. Rain clouds are building up over the interior, ready to bring relief to the thirsty land of Namibia. The welcome rains reach the dry riverbeds leading to the coast and soon turn them into mighty torrents. Confirming the link between the interior and the coast, the muddy waters finally discharge into the Atlantic Ocean. Eventually, all returns back to normal, with the waters dissipating into the desert sands. But these desert rivers are also the lifeblood for remarkable creatures. Northern Namibia is famous for its desert elephants. Totaling a few hundred, these magnificent creatures are particularly well adapted to the conditions prevailing in the coastal Namib desert. They move up and down the dry riverbeds, down to the skeleton coast, and depending on the rains, may venture far from the riverbeds and onto the plains. Almost unbelievably, another large mammal ventures here. King of the big cats, and the crown of all creation, the desert lions of the skeleton coast. Numbering scarcely a hundred and spread over a vast area, their presence graces this coast beyond imagination. Today, these lions are a flagship species for high-end tourism. For this economic reason, and simply for their sheer beauty, they can never be allowed to disappear. There are other desert rivers 
without which certain higher forms of life cannot exist in the arid lands. One of them is the Koisep River, separating the red dunes from the gravel plains. The river seldom runs on the surface, but the underground water flow supports large acacia trees. They bear nutritious pods protected by spiky thorns that deter herbivores. They are, however, no match for the big horns of the oryx, who shakes the tree with its horns to dislodge the pods. Acacia pods also provide fodder for the animals of the Topnar Namas, a striking example of reliance on natural resources in a land of scarcity. Living this life on the edge for thousands of years, the Topnars are the people who have been associated with this coastal region for the longest time and are thought to be direct descendants of the so-called Strandlopers or beachcombers. To survive here, they have another secret weapon, the nara plant. It bears a delicious melon, the treasure of which is protected by spiky thorns. The fruit is rich in vitamins, and the Topnar culture closely evolved around this plant, which they cherish from a very young age. The plant is processed in many ways for its juice, sweet and sticky flesh, and even the pips, which are very high in protein. The leftovers are equally appreciated further down the food chain. The Topnars are livestock farmers like other Nama groups, some of which live 600 kilometers further south along the banks of the Orange River. Flowing through the Namib, the river meets the sea at Oranjumunt. Its mouth is a paradise for birds. Numerous species breed at this Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance. Others frolic in the waters, taking a break from their long journeys. North from here, the next heaven in a waterless world is also a Ramsar site. Sandwich Harbour, where the waters of the Koisep River surface at the coast, not far from the town of Volfus Bay. In this veritable oasis, many birds fatten up and ready themselves for their long journeys across waterless landscapes. But upstream, water extraction from the Koisep River has led to changes over a mere three decades that are ominous and far-reaching. A tragedy in the making. Compare this photograph taken in 1975 with this one taken in 1992 and then this one from 2008. On the gravel plains north of the Koiseb, only the hardiest species survive. Eating one's own old skin means nothing is wasted here. Other survivors are the lichens, of which there is a great variety. And the remarkable Welwitchia mirabilis. It can survive very hot periods, and has long tap roots and the ability to absorb dew at night. It is believed that certain individuals may be as old as 2,000 years. Then it is night, and a time for creatures who live and die by it.
the trapdoor spider disappears in an instant. Never venturing beyond the red dunes, the dune gerbil economizes on water and even concentrates its own urine to recirculate more water through its body. The town of Swakopmund is an oasis for humans along the desert coast. As in Luderitz, the German colonial legacy is evident in the town's architecture. The rocky harbour provides shelter against the rigours of the ocean. It is a base for marine diamond mining and fishing and is well known for the lobster industry based here. Such coastal riches, including the land-based diamond mines in southern Namibia, have lured many people here from other parts of the country in search of a better life. Sadly, their aspirations are not always met. The sea provides in many ways. Some collect bait here, or mussels for protein, and even ornaments for tourist trinkets. Others use the coast for recreation, or simply to catch a fish to feed their families. For many people from the interior, the Namibian coast is a place to enjoy themselves, or simply to renew the soul. But certain times of the year, the coast becomes almost too popular. The desert coast is flooded by people, putting all resources, including fresh water, under immense pressure. It's a coast of many uses and different activities, from dune boarding to something much noisier. Loved by some, quad biking has become a controversial activity due to the noise they make and the tracks they leave. The desert environment is extremely sensitive and thoughtless and unregulated behavior will leave marks on the landscape like scars on a human face. Other sports, such as paragliding, can be gentle as the afternoon breeze, while kite surfing on the rough seas is reserved for the most daring and fearless. One thing is for sure, all Namibians love their coast and most want to see it used right and not used up. Ecotourism is the way to go. Where else can one admire such a variety of creatures at close range? Tourism is Namibia's fastest growing industry, almost all of it nature-based, with nearly one million visitors each year. Activities that do not damage nature must now be balanced with industries based on non-renewable resources. Granite is one non-renewable product of the coastal areas. Whereas some kinds of salt mining are renewable. Diamonds may very well be the resource that the Namibian coast is best known for. But now, the land-based part of the industry is in sharp decline, the bulk of the riches exported to distant lands. The new rush is for uranium. This open cast mine is too deep for anyone to ever dream of filling it up. This mine uses two to three million cubic meters of water per year, competing with other resource users in a country where water is a scarce commodity. And more mines are coming, as this map shows. It is not the only industry that is growing. Real estate development is rampant, as if there are no limits to resources. And everything works with water. Everyone wants a part of the coast. Many houses are built very close to the water's edge, the restless growling of the sea often going unnoticed. Coastal erosion has now become a real danger, mostly due to the ignorance of those 
who ignore global climate change and sea level rise. Notice how close the water has come to this house, compared with only a year ago. As the towns grow and mining activity increases, the Namibian coast will become thirstier. New technology, like desalination plants, will have to provide a way for the future, such as this one being built north of Swakopmund. Wolfis Bay is where a large part of the fishing industry is based. The species with the highest commercial value are hake, sardines, horse mackerel and tuna. Half a million tons of fish are harvested each year in Namibian waters to feed our growing population. Even so, over 90% is exported, bringing in valuable foreign revenue. But after rigor mortis takes place. Unfortunately, although marine resources are renewable, over-exploitation has often driven fishing stocks to dangerously low levels in the past. Another casualty of over-exploitation was the southern right whale that became extinct in Namibian waters. Only now are these magnificent creatures slowly returning to grace us with their presence. The ports put even more pressure on the coast. Large tankers bring fuel and plans must be in place if anything goes wrong. Other container ships have to dock here. They are the vehicles of export of the Namibian products and also bring products from afar that are conveyed to the interior to meet the nation's many needs. In spite of development, large parts of the coast have remained relatively pristine. Driving westward in Kunani, one will find mountains interspersed with plains, where after good rains, animals will graze as they have for eons. The path to the coast is blocked by a fence for the Skeleton Coast National Park, which has restricted access to this piece of the coast for many over a number of decades. Here, for the most part, Nature continues as it has since time immemorial. The question is whether lessons from the past have been learned. The Namibian coast is one of a kind, with unparalleled beauty and wilderness, which in many other parts of the world have been lost forever. Not to mention biodiversity found nowhere else. It is well worth looking after. As a major step forward, the entire coastal area, except for the big towns, will soon form one large national park, the longest in the world. It will also include marine protected areas where seabirds can be safe from the dangers that threaten them. But these are parks with a new mission, to protect nature, but at the same time, unlock opportunities that will help sustain those that live along the coast, as well as bring much needed national revenue through tourism. This then is the strategy followed by one country in Africa, a continent where natural resources are decreasing and the beauty of nature is slowly but surely corroding. Only the future will tell if this egg will hatch to make a dream come true of a coast where at last balance between conservation and development was achieved. Only if this can happen will Namibia's coastal areas be used wisely in order for the present generation to be sustained without jeopardizing the chances of future generations to meet their own needs. Ours is a coast for all Namibians. If we look after it, it will look after us. <laughs>